Writing the discussion section of your paper is also going to be very challenging in parallel to writing the introduction section because it also follows a fairly complex logical structure that's kind of difficult to follow. Here we're going to talk about the discussion section. If you are interested in the introduction section, I have a video for that, so please feel free to check that one out as well. Now for the introduction section, I explained to you that it follows a funnel or, or V-shape, which means you start more generally why a certain topic is important, and then you basically guide the reader step by step through the logic and you culminate in the formulation of the statement, goal or hypotheses for your particular study. This is the introduction section. Now the discussion section has the basically the mirror image in terms of shape. It's like an inverted V or funnel, if you will. It starts with the particular findings of your study and then it puts it into the broader context of the particular body of literature of work in your field. Now we're gonna go through how you're actually gonna do that and write a discussion section. So it starts with a succinct summary of what you found namely the main finding. Now, there is always going to be some other storyline in there as well. Most papers have like a main storyline and then some subordinate storylines. Of course, you need to make very clear in the entire paper what is your main storyline. And so when I say write a succinct statement, I mean that main storyline. So don't forget that. <laughs> super important not to get distracted by all the other stuff that your paper may be telling you. Here the first sentence is the main question you have posed, the main overarching goal, in a very general sense, you summarize this here. Now this is not the abstract, this is not the summary, you don't recap everything. You basically just have with one or two lines, you make very clear what was the main thing that you got out at the coarsest level. And time to go into detail, there's plenty of that later on in the discussion section. Here, this is just the most general statement. Like here we show using an experiment that multiple global change factors will affect ecosystem process race. Or here we provide evidence of the importance of biodiversity for ecosystem process rates, like such and such. But it's a very, very concise statement. Concise meaning not long and hitting the main message of your paper. Now, this is the tip of your inverted V from which you're developing all the rest of your discussion. So this is the, the sentence that really needs to hit the main message very well. So if you like, you know, revising and revising and revising, this is the one sentence where you should spend time on so that that hits it just right. And then you can continue with the other questions or hypotheses or goals that your paper had. You know, the subordinate storylines, how they were addressed, and you can have them organized in subsections or however you want to do that. Many times discussions have like subsections depending on the journal. And so then you can deal with the various aspects of your story that way. In each of these little subsections, it's important that you go broader and broader with your implications and that you qualify, this is super important, that you qualify the degree to which your particular finding can be generalized to what point. I'll give you an example. For example, you did a study on, let's say, a model fungal species in the abuscular mycorrhizal fungi, Rhizophagus irregularis. So then you talk about what you found and you know you need to most likely at some point state to what extent is this generalizable to abuscular mycorrhizal fungi, the entire phylum. And of course you need to qualify that. It's like, well, we don't actually know because you only worked with Rhizophagus irregularis. So there is a quite a great diversity within AM fungi that you have not captured in your experiment. And so there, of course, you need to qualify where your study does not have the data to make that statement solid, right? And without becoming negative. But you know, you need to, you need to make sure to what degree can you generalize it. And the way you do that best is if you use conditional sentences like if then. So if um, this same pattern is found in other species of AM fungi, then it's conclusive evidence that such and such happens for this phylum, let's say. Or maybe you did it in a grassland. And so you need to explain to what extent is that going to be most likely typical of the grassland ecosystem and can some aspects of the results may be generalized to terrestrial ecosystems as a whole or not at all. 
And you need to qualify that. You need to support it, of course, with the respective pieces of information, citing the literature. Uh, and you need to give reason for why you think this can be extrapolated. And you need to explain what are sort of limitations to making this generalization. This is, of course, tricky and this is difficult, right? You need to very carefully argue here. And you cannot drop into sort of a mode of saying, well, this is a limitation, we don't really know that, and our study could not deliver this. Don't do that, right? This is, this is why I said use these conditional sentences, like if this pattern is also confirmed in other ecosystem types, then it could be a global pattern. Or if this is found also in other phyla of fungi, then maybe this could be something that is typical of the Eumycota kingdom as a whole, or something like this. So formulate it in a positive way, say what kind of data, what kind of additional information in future work should be collected in order to make this an even more well-rounded, basically, statement that you can make in this particular study. Now, as you make these kinds of arguments for the different strands of the discussion section, you will be moving automatically from more specific statements to more general statements. And when you make this move, it's important to remind yourself that when you want to support specific statements with references, you need these specific references. These are primary literature papers. Whereas when you want to support statements with references that are of a more broad and general nature, you need to use suitably broad references. And those would be review papers, books, and book chapters. This is the same as in the introduction, which I explained in this other video. But basically, don't mix these up, right? This is uh, just bad citation. It's just basically a citation error. So make sure that you match the source with the degree of generality of the statement that you are supporting. This is, of course, work. Right? I mean, I'm not saying this is easy or uh, anything like that. This takes a lot of work because you, you need, really need to think about what would be suitable broad sources and what would be specific statements that really um, support that particular point I'm making right here. So this is why this is hard. Now, as I said, it's a very important part of the discussion section to also discuss the limitations. And I mentioned it is very, very important to still use positive language. Now, it is clear that no study is perfect, right? This does not exist in ecology anyways, the environmental studies. There is, a, there is no such thing as a perfect study. They are all limited in some way, either in terms of experimental control, in terms of the realism they can reflect. So, but then, you know, for example, if in a lab experiment, to give you an example, um, you know, you you may be tempted to say, well, this is just a lab experiment and I cannot really extrapolate that to the field. So then that comes across as a bummer, right? It's like, oh, why did I even read that? Now I've read the entire paper, come to the discussion section and it tells me it doesn't mean anything in the real world. So don't do that, right? <laughs> so what you would write is like, we have done a lab experiment here to really clearly establish mechanism and to have very good experimental control and control of environmental conditions. And uh, therefore we can have great confidence in this mechanism um, and what it does, or this pattern that we found, or whatever it was that you did. And then you can say, well, the next step would be, so you can basically say it's like charting the research going forward, that next step should now be to also verify if this pattern holds up in the field, where this and this and this and this mechanism would also be coming into action and therefore might limit actually the way that this mechanism that we've just found in the controlled environment study might unfold and be realized. But do you see the difference? <laughs> right? is, is one thing if you say this is a lab experiment and we're sorry, we can't extrapolate to the field. It's kind of a bummer, but you say like, we did a lab experiment, we did this for us for a reason. You always do a study for a certain reason. You made that choice to do a lab experiment, a field experiment, do it in a grassland, do it in 50 grasslands or in just one grassland. You made whatever decision you made for a reason to allow you a certain statement. And so then it's important to remind yourself of that advantage that you um, basically that you sought in the beginning and then if there is a limitation, just state what is the nature of the limitation, what you would have to do in order to get to that next step. That is a much more positive way to deal with limitation. And of course, a sure way to fail a discussion section is basically, if you can fail a discussion section, I don't know, but this is like if you overinterpret things and if you, if you go basically off into la-la land and whatever you say there is no longer supported by your findings and the data in your paper. This is almost always like a Reason for a rejection, because in every reviewer uh, guidelines is said like, are the conclusions really based on the data? And so 
you need to make that extrapolation as you move to more general very, very carefully. And in every step, you need to clearly explain what are the conditions, you know, why could you maybe make that step towards more general? What other information would you need? Do you have that other information? Can you draw that from the literature? And therefore, when looking at it overall, this more broader general picture clearly emerges and is well supported. And so, the, yeah, this is a, a super important thing for the discussion. Those generalizations that you make, they need to be well supported. Or if there are little gaps, you need to make sure what those gaps are and how they are being filled. And you end the discussion section with a conclusion. Sometimes this is also a, a separate header, depending on the journal, that entitled conclusions. But uh, even if there isn't, you end the discussion section with a general concluding statement. This is not a summary. It's not an abstract. It's not a rephrasement, <laughs> a rephrasing of basically that first sentence that you started the discussion section with. No, this is the statement where you say what this means in the grander scheme of things. You know, what is the overall conclusion? What is the significance of what you did? What have we learned? How has this moved things forward? Maybe with a little statement about and this contributes to an effort of overall to better characterize this thing. And so this is your conclusion section. Um, it can also entail sort of an outlook of what is to come next as a matter of taste, but this is what should come at the very end. And so I hope this will help you write an awesome discussion section for your paper. And with that, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.